presentation, and we can stop for questions along the way. Basically, it's a two-part presentation. Uh, we're talking about vaccinations and uh, and uh, cancer prevention. I, I call this an update in preventive care. So, what does preventive care mean? Preventive care is uh, medical care that focuses on disease prevention and health maintenance. And this definition I got from the medical dictionary. Uh, and screening tests, health education, we're right in the heart of health education, and immunization programs are common to preventive care. So I'm talking about some screening tests and some immunizations as part of preventive care. Let's start with a patient, for point of reference. Our first patient is a 65-year-old male with a history of type 2 diabetes who comes to your office for a routine exam. So, in terms of preventive care, what kind of vaccines should this patient receive? Here's a list of the common adult vaccines that you may be familiar with that I deal with on a daily basis as a general internist. There's the annual influenza or flu shot that you're aware of that's uh, manufactured and comes out in the fall every year. There's a booster vaccine which contains tetanus and pertussis and it's a booster because you get your first tetanus and pertussis vaccines when you're a child, and then as adults, we're not talking about giving a booster. It's called a Tdap. I'll refer to that as a Tdap vaccine. Then there's herpes zoster, or the shingles vaccine. The brand name is Zostavax. And then we also have uh, vaccines that prevent uh, disease by the pneumococcal or pneumonia bacteria. I'm not going to talk about the flu shot today, but there's been some changes and some recommendations with these three vaccines, what I'll talk about now. Let's stop, start with the uh, herpes zoster or shingles vaccine. First of all, what is it? Who should receive the vaccine? And why should they receive it? So varicella zoster virus uh, is an infection that can lead to two different distinct diseases. Varicella, better known as chicken pox, which is usually a childhood disease, and herpes zoster, also known as shingles, both caused by the same virus. After the primary infection, or chicken pox, the virus lies dormant in a nerve root near the spinal cord, by the spinal cord. Reactivation of this dormant virus can lead to herpes zoster, or shingles. The virus is hiding out in your body for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and reappears as an adult, possibly causing shingles. Here's a picture of shingles or herpes zoster. This is a, the classic rash across someone's mid thoracic or mid back area. It's a large area of redness covered in small what we call vesicles, which are small little fluid-covered lesions. And it's along a particular pattern, which is typical of zoster, which is along the nerve root from which it emerged. So here's a thoracic nerve root that is now become inflamed by reactivation of the virus. And that nerve root goes along the back, along the like, alongside of a rib, and wraps around. It can occur in any nerve root. It can be up in the arm, in the leg, and also on the face. So who gets herpes zoster? Estimated about a million cases in the United States occur every year. Its incident increases with age, especially over the age of 70. Over the age of 50, but even more over the age of 70. Age is related to decreased immunity to the virus the immunity which we gain at the primary infection, or chickenpox, and there are other risk factors associated with developing zoster, including uh, having cancer, or a compromised immune system. Frequently medications can compromise your, your immune system, such as steroids, or chemotherapies, or other medications that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. Patients with chronic lung disease are at higher risk for developing uh, zoster, as well as patients who have uh, kidney disease are also at increased risk. 
So what are the problems that we're concerned about uh, in terms of preventing zoster? Well, zoster during its acute manifestations can be very painful, can be a mild pain or severe pain, and typically last in an uncomplicated fashion up to four weeks. The most concerning complication, the dreaded complication of zoster is something called post-herpetic neuralgia, which is pain that occurs after the first four weeks of the onset of shingles. This pain is often very, very severe and thus can af significantly affect the quality of life of the patient. Moreover, it's frequently difficult to treat. It's a specific type of pain syndrome called neuropathic pain, which is often uh, needs a certain types of medications to treat and can be very difficult to manage. And the incidence of neuropathic pain or post herpetic neuralgia increases with age. About one third of patients who get herpes zoster over, the 79, over 79 years old will develop post herpetic neuralgia. So we have an elderly, maybe a more frail population developing uh, chronic pain, which is obviously a huge problem. So uh, the zoster vaccine, so the herpes zoster vaccine, was developed. And the current guidelines recommend that vaccinations be given to every adult one time starting at the age of 60. The FDA has approved uh, the vaccine for over 50, but the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, currently advises getting at age 60 to ensure adequate uh, protection in those later years. So how effective is the shingles vaccine? Well, we have data from some studies, and specifically I'm going to talk about the shingle prevention study, which involved 38,000 adults who were over the age of 60, and they were followed for three years. It was a placebo control trial, which means half of the 38,000 adults received the shingles vaccine, and half did not receive the vaccine. And what they found after following these patients was that the incidence of zoster was reduced by 51% uh, compared with the patients who did not get the vaccine. And in the patients who developed zoster, uh, the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia was reduced to two-thirds. The greatest benefit of the vaccine was seen in patients who were over 70 years old. I do want to point out that even if you get the vaccine, it doesn't mean you are guaranteed to be protected from zoster. It reduced the incidence by 50%, but the other 50% still could get zoster. Uh, similarly, just because you get the vaccine and get zoster, it doesn't mean you're not going to develop post herpetic neuralgia, but your chances of developing that complication are decreased. So it's a vaccine that's effective, but no guarantee. Some precautions about the vaccine. Well, it's, it is a live attenuated virus, so it can cause a good reaction in the uh, injection site. Be associated with some pain, usually manageable with some ice and Tylenol. As a live virus, you should never give it uh, to a pregnant woman or any woman of childbearing age. Uh, you shouldn't give it to people who are immune suppressed, who are getting, getting chemotherapy or high dose steroids, and other immune suppressed patients who are transplants or HIV. If you're allergic to neomycin or gelatin or uh, other constituents of the vaccine, you cannot get it. It's paid for by Medicare D, unlike the flu shot, which is part of your, your visit. Medicare D is your prescription plan, and therefore, um, often you have to pay out of pocket and get reimbursed. Sometimes your doctor will give you a prescription, and you can take it to a pharmacy, and they'll give you the injection there. So you have to know that the payment mechanism for Medicare patients is often a little different than other routine vaccines. Next, I'd like to talk about uh, pneumococcal disease and prevention with the pneumovax. Uh, pneumococcal is caused by, uh, pneumococcal disease is caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae, and it's the leading cause of what we call community-acquired pneumonia. That's what a, a pneumonia that you get when you live at home and in a normal life as opposed to normal, as opposed to a, a pneumonia that you get if you're in the hospital or pneumonia that you may acquire if you're in a nursing home. Uh, in addition to pneumonia, pneumococcal disease can give you sinusitis, otitis, media, which is ear infections, meningitis, a serious infection of the surrounding of the brain, endocarditis, a serious infection of the valves of the heart, 
osteomyelitis, infection of bones, and sepsis, which is a syndrome where the bacteria enters your blood and causes decreases in blood pressure and other complications. So pneumococcal disease is not just about pneumonia, but other serious disease. Here's a photograph of an x-ray showing classic pneumococcal pneumonia. So here are the lungs. And this black area is nice aerated lung where you have uh, the healthy lung being aerated. And this is your spine here, your heart. And this area here, this white wedge, is where the air is uh, being obscured because it's filled with fluid or infection in this pizza-shaped uh, consolidation we call them. This is your classic pneumococcal pneumonia or lobar pneumonia. So what vaccines are available to prevent pneumococcal related disease? Well we have a vaccine that many of you might be familiar with called the Pneumovax or the fancy name is the PPSV23 or pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine which immunizes against 23 serotypes or different species of pneumococcus. It is recommended for all adults 65 years or older. And we also give it at a younger age to patients who have some chronic medical conditions that might predispose them to pneumococcal infection, including patients with diabetes, chronic lung disease, such as emphysema, bronchitis, asthma, or patients with congestive heart failure, just to name a few. Many of you may have already received Pneumovax. However, there's a second pneumococcal vaccine, which is important to know about uh, because of recent recommendations. This is called, the brand name is called Prevnar, or the PCV13. It's a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, which protects against 13 uh, serotypes. It's related to vaccines that have been used in infants and children since the year 2000. But as of the fall of 2014, the CDC has recommended that all adults 65 or older receive this second pneumococcal vaccine. We also give this Prevnar or PCV13 in a certain subpopulation of adults who have uh, serious diseases that predispose them to pneumococcal uh, infections, including malignancies, patients who have kidney failure or on dialysis, or patients with HIV. So now we have two pneumococcal vaccines. Which one do we, do we give it to them? Does it matter? Do we give them both at once? Who should get them? For a typical patient that's a otherwise healthy 65-year-old, we start with the PCD13 or Prevnar. The second vaccine, the Pneumovax, the PPSV23, should be given the must be given at least 6 to 12 months later. Has to wait, has to be a time interval to give the second vaccine. Many patients in the community, especially over 65, have already received the Pneumovax. So what do we do with them? If you've already received the Pneumovax, you should re receive the Prevnar vaccine, but at least one year since you re received that Pneumovax. Adverse reactions generally a very well tolerated vaccine. Some pain and tenderness, just like with any other vaccine, about 60% will experience some minor pain at the injection site. Swelling less common, redness even less common. Third vaccine I want to talk about is the Tdap vaccine. Tdap is a combination vaccine which protects against tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. The A stands for acellular pertussis. It tells you how the vaccine was produced. So tetanus, you may know, is also called lockjaw. It's a severe muscle tightening and stiffness. It's very lethal. It's caused by a bacteria. It can be found in contaminated or soiled metal. Uh, and it can enter the skin through cuts and bruises. Diphtheria, frequently a childhood disease. It was responsible for a lot of childhood death 60, 70, 80 years ago. It's a thick coating in the back of the throat that can lead to respiratory failure. We don't see much of it now because of the vaccines uh, that we give in childhood. And pertussis, known as the whooping cough, is uh, severe coughing spells, which often leads to frequent hospitalizations. 
the diagnosis is often often missed, and we're missing more because of uh, recent outbreaks that we're not used to seeing. Uh, tw ten, ten years ago, there was very little pertussis in the adult population, and now we're seeing it more frequently with epidemics reported in different cities. One of the reasons why we are now boosting uh, with the Tdap is not just for the tetanus, but for the pertussis. So here's a picture of a patient with pertussis. And you see a young person, can be, so pertussis affects people of all ages, with a severe cough, he's grabbing his uh, chest, because the chest, the coughs become in, come in these violent, violent paroxysms. That's the hallmark of whooping cough, is that you're not coughing at all, and then you have these violent, violent spells that can be so forceful that patients can actually break ribs. And he's grabbing his chest because he feels like he's going to break his rib with these violent, violent coughing spells. So a little bit about the Tdap vaccine. There's a version of it, very similar, which is a routine childhood vaccine. However, there's waning immunity. We know uh, by testing adults that about half of the adults over age 20 will have, only half will have protective antibodies against uh, these diseases. The tetanus diphtheria booster should be given every 10 years. That's a recommendation that we're familiar with. We now are recommending in the last uh, uh, five years or so ago that the Tdap, the combination with the pertussis, should be one of these boosters. So you get the t TD booster every 10 years, you replace one of them with the Tdap booster. And these guidelines since 2010 also include adults over the age of 65. Side effects, again, usually mild, pain or tenderness at the injection site, mild fever, headache, or fatigue. I haven't seen this patient get any serious side effects uh, that they reported to me. So back to our original patient. There's a 65-year-old male with a history of type 2 diabetes who came into your office for a routine exam. He should receive the Zoster vaccine if he has not already been given it. He should receive the TD. Tdap, if not, if he hasn't received in the last 10 years, and he should, he should receive either the PCV13 or Prevnar if he never received the Numavax, or the PCV13 if he received the Numavax more than a year <coughs> ago. Caution: You do not give the Zoster or Numavax in the same visit. They have to be spread apart in order for them to be uh, entirely effective. So those are the three vaccines I want to talk about. In the second part of my talk, I want to briefly talk about some concepts involving screening for cancer, especially screening for cancer in the elderly. So patient number two is an 80-year-old woman with a history of congestive heart failure and moderate emphysema. She has not had a mammogram in five years or a colonoscopy in 10 years. What should you advise her in terms of cancer prevention? 80-year-old woman, some mild, significant medical problems. What should we advise her regarding colonoscopy and mammograms? So here's a list of some common cancer screening tests. Screening for colon cancer is done with colonoscopy, uh, ideally. Breast cancer screening, as you know, is done with mammograms. We screen for cervical cancer in women with a pap smear, prostate cancer, highly controversial screening. The only real uh, test that's employed widely is the PSA, or it's a blood test. And lung cancer, uh, again, up for debate, we are often screening people with a history, significant history of smoking with CAT scans to look for early stages of lung cancer. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, what do we mean by screening? Well, screening is doing a test to find a disease in a patient who has no symptoms of the disease. If the patient has a symptom, you're not screening, you are diagnosing. If we detect a disease, then we must be able to save lives. If we detect a disease through a screening test, we, we have to know that cure is possible. We have to also know if we detect a disease and a person has no symptoms, that we can reduce suffering, that treatment is acceptable to both the patient and the family.
There's a lot of discussion in the medical community about cancer screening, not necessarily what test to do, but also when do we start doing tests? How frequently do we repeat the test? How frequently do you do mammograms? How frequently do you do uh, colonoscopies? But I want to call your attention to one other very important and controversial area, an area which is going to be very, very important to our society as our society ages and our healthcare dollars become more precious, is when do we stop screening for cancer? When do we stop doing tests to find disease in patients who have no symptoms? And another way of looking or reframing this question is, when do the harms of screening outweigh the benefits? The benefits theoretically are to save lives, extend life, and prevent suffering. Screening can detect both cancers that shorten a patient's life and cancers that will not affect a patient's life. Detecting cancers that will never impact the patient's life may lead to overdiagnosis and unnecessary treatment. Thus, screening may produce potential harms to the patient. An extreme example would be a 90-year-old woman who has mild dementia and severe arthritis who is bedbound in a nursing home. Are you going to do mammograms on that woman to find the cancer? that you would have to treat? Or would that be subjecting the patient to unnecessary testing, treatment, suffering, harms? Will that cancer they detect extend their life if we treat it? That's an extreme example. We can back up. Say the patient's only 80. Has severe lung disease, not demented. Start figuring out, when do we think we're going to help the patient? So cancer screening the elderly, what benefits could it have? Finding a curable cancer at an early stage. Prevent death and reduce suffering, all desirable outcomes. But what are the harms? The risk of the test itself. So a colonoscopy, usually a very safe test. Nevertheless, there's a calculated risk to it. Patient has to take a prep, maybe a biopsy. The biopsy has associated risks. Say you find that cancer in the colon. Now we have to treat it. We're going to subject the elderly person to surgery, possibly chemotherapy. And even if we cure the person, the person may have to have prolonged hospitalization. Hospitalization in the elderly, very dangerous, acquiring infections, blood clots, falls, other complications. Hospitalization in the elderly is a very serious thing. And more to the point, even if we find the cancer and cure the cancer, would that patient have died of something else before that cancer affected them? How long would that cancer take to affect their life relative to when they would have died of more natural causes or other diseases that they have? So when to stop screening? What are some of the considerations? So clearly, the age of the patient and based on the age, we can calculate the average life expectancy. However, the li average life expectancy is going to be affected by the patient's comorbidities or other illnesses. If the patient has significant disease, cancer, severe heart disease, uh, poorly controlled diabetes, that is obviously going to affect their life expectancy regardless of their age. And of course, never forget what the patient's preferences and values are patient doesn't want to be tested because they would never have treatment and you don't do the test. If the patient knows they'll never be treated because they don't want any treatment, there's no point in testing. So we have official recommendations about when to stop cancer screening. For breast cancers, most experts recommend stopping mammograms when an individual's life expectancy is less than 10 years. Sounds like a soft calculation, but you can make a pretty reasonable estimate. In terms of colon cancer screening with colonoscopies, similarly, the American College of Physicians recommends stopping colonoscopies at age 75 or when the patient's life expectancy is less than 10 years. 
those are just, I'm not talking about the other uh, cancer screenings, I'm just going to focus on mammograms and colonoscopies. Because back to our patient, remember, she was an 80 year old woman with a history of congestive heart failure and moderate emphysema, who has not had a mammogram in five years or a colonoscopy in 10 years. What should you advise her? Well, given her congestive heart failure and moderate emphysema, I'd say she has significant comorbidities, significant underlying diseases which will affect her life expectancy. I would estimate an eight-year-old woman with this, whose life expectancy is far less than 10 years. Thus, she is unlikely to benefit from the detection of cancer, and screening will thus introduce harms and likely no extension of life. However, these are just guidelines. And there are exceptions. And I like these pictures of these guys, probably all over 80, running down the beach. These guys look like they're in pretty good shape. And I think we would consider them to be good candidates, possibly, if they wanted, for some screening tests. So we always individualize. Thank you very much. That's excellent.